A couple of things I've got to go off my chest about the news this morning. Okay. First of all, the policeman that's talking about young drivers hmm. speeding. And he's saying, rightly, speeding is for on the track, not for on the road. Which is great advice. Driving on the road and driving in motorsport, totally different things. Motorsport does not belong on the road. Why is no one saying this about cyclists? Cycling belongs on a track or in a velodrome, not on the road. You know, you never see a Formula One motor race happen on an open road. Most famous road circuit, Monaco. Mm. They close the roads for Absolutely. the Grand Prix. They get people out of the way because it would be dangerous otherwise. And exactly the same with cycle races. You never see the Tour de France run on open public roads. They close the roads for the cycle race. And the police are telling young drivers, sport doesn't belong on the roads. Why aren't they telling cyclists? And cyclists, they dress up in the cycling clothes, the lycra and the day glow. And then they cycle in groups. I can only assume they're racing each other because you see them in a, in a whole... Well, it's like a pack, isn't it? Yeah. They're, they're, there's, what, two or three people cycling yeah. alongside each other? on an open road. It needs to finish. Last year, 113 people were killed on bicycles on the road. But it seems that the opposite is happening and successive governments are encouraging us to cycle on the road. How can we have one rule about speeding drivers and another one about cyclists? Brexit negotiations turning nasty. Yes. I mean, Theresa May is doing her grand tour of the various parts of the UK at the moment. Mm. And she says she's prepared to negotiate hard. Negotiate. Theresa May says she's prepared to negotiate hard. Now, I don't know how, because usually in a negotiation, the person who gets the best deal is the person who can walk away. If you're negotiating to buy a car over price and you can say, you know what, I'm not interested, and you genuinely mean it, you can't bluff in a negotiation. But we've got no bargaining chip because we've already said we're leaving whatever. So it's not like if you don't give us what we want, we're going to leave. No, we're going to leave. Our Prime Minister, Theresa Mayhem, keeps telling us she's going to negotiate hard. Or what? And really, the press are weak. The press need to, to, to challenge her on that and say, what does that mean, negotiate hard? What's the leverage here in the negotiation that we've got? I don't see we've got any. What are we going to do if we don't get a great deal? Stay? We can't do that. There's a mandate from the people after a referendum and it's been talked about in Parliament and voted on in Parliament. We're leaving. Whatever. We'll have to take the deal that the EU say we're going to get. They will fix the price and if we want out, we will have to pay it. And one of the commentators yesterday was saying this could be a very, very complicated deal because each of the EU nations all want different things from this. Yeah. The figure that's being thrown around is £50 billion pounds to get out. But it'll be whatever, the, whatever price they set. If she's got some bargaining chip up her sleeve, she needs to say what it is. Otherwise, we're in trouble. Now, it's getting nasty. A senior Conservative MP has urged the government to tactfully remind European officials that the UK helped Germany waive half of its war debt in the 1950s. This is Sir Bill Cash. He's the chair of the European Scrutiny Committee. So this isn't just some backbench MP. This is a guy involved. He said it would be a useful point to make given, and I quote, 
Germany's extremely dominant role in the European Union and insisted that we really don't owe anything to the European Union. So he, he's done it. He's dared to bring it up. Don't mention the war. I mentioned it once, but I think I got away with it all right. <laughs> you don't mention the war. Now, first of all, you can't go back on a deal. The deal was, you, you've surrendered now and it's all over and we have peace. You know what, all that debt, let's just cut it in half. This was back at the beginning of the 1950s. I yeah. Think. You can't go back on that deal, that's a deal. You can't bring that up when you're talking about a new deal. Some of this goes back to debt from the First World War. Right. Which is a long a hundred time ago. A hundred yeah. years later, you can't go back and say, you know this deal we're negotiating now? You know that other deal we did? I'm, I'm not going to stick to that one now. Yeah. You can't do that. I just hope, after bringing this up, after saying to the European Union, well, look, we did write off a lot of debt after the war with Germany. I just hope Germany don't come back and give us the bill for the damage that the RAF did to Berlin, Dresden and Hamburg. This is Bob. I'm Graham Mack. Let's get the latest news with Chris Hubbard. Well, Britain's tech-savvy iPhone generation, as they're being called, may know what a dongle is, may know how to use an iPhone and even create an app, but are clueless when it comes to changing a light bulb. According to a survey, under 35s lack basic DIY skills, so... They uh, can change a light bulb. Well, that's an exaggeration, isn't it? Surely well, they can change a light bulb. I know somebody who got a man in to go and change a light bulb for them. Was this somebody... Female? No. Oh! No, no you it see, was a bloke! You see, I've gone on about this before. We're witnessing the end of the human race. Not only are more female babies being born than males but the ma the young males are not masculine every generation is more feminine than the next admit it chris your dad was more masculine than you oh yeah absolutely he could yeah. build things out of bricks and my dad blocks. my dad built a garage out of bricks yeah. and he was a plumber so you know and i bet his dad was more masculine than him because well, his dad fought in a, in the First World War. Yeah, well, my my granddad fought in the Second World War and worked down a mine. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so each, each generation of male is becoming more and more metrosexual. And we're starting to... And, you know, you've got people like uh, girly man David Beckham. Was You know, he tried to get lots of tattoos to look hard, but he's still a girly man. And these <laughs> these metrosexuals... Women love them, love them, but they don't realize, no, sometimes you need a bloke. In a time of crisis, somebody has to change that wheel. Somebody has to change that light bulb. Somebody, somebody has to bleed a radiator. Bleed a radiator. That's what, that's really satisfying though. Yeah, rewire a fuse or these days even just reset a circuit breaker. That's beyond them. Finding the fuse box, beyond <laughs> them. It all changed when men started calling shirts tops. <laughs> it's not a top it's a shirt it's not a top it's a jersey it's not a top it's a sweater or a pullover it's never a top tops are girls clothes it's never a top ever it's a t-shirt it's not a top well, according to this research, eight in ten young women expect their partner to be a decent DIYer and yes. be able to do these things. Yes, ladies, look what you're doing by being attracted to these metrosexuals and breeding with them. You're creating even more metrosexuals. <laughs> you need to seek out the real men who will be there for you in a time of crisis and when you go into the bathroom, they haven't stolen your hair straighteners or your goop. Chris Hubbard. Yes. What is going on in the world? Well, I'm guessing you're talking about this, this ban on uh, passengers carrying laptops, tablets and other gadgets. Is that right? Airport security checks are a joke. Now, there's a Muslim laptop ban. Mm. 
It's from certain countries. It's going to be introduced in the next few days. Uh, so people on flights from Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Tunisia and Saudi uh, will all have to put the devices in their hold luggage. When you fly to Britain from the Muslim countries of Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Tunisia and Saudi Arabia, you're not allowed to bring a laptop or tablet computer onto the plane with you. You have to put it in the luggage you check in. That's right, yeah. Now, apart from it being easier now for your laptop to get lost with your luggage mm -hmm. or stolen, this just proves that all of those security checks you have to go through are useless. Until the Muslim ban came in, every computer you took on a plane was x-rayed and inspected. That's right, yes. You had to put them through the x-ray machine separate to your other stuff. No, is there, is there a laptop in there? Is it take it out? The laptop has to go in a separate bin. Has, is there a laptop in there? It has to be separate. Now they're saying it'll be safer to bury them in your suitcase. Since we've had heightened security at airports, they haven't found anything that can bring down a plane. Not a single thing. All they've done is confiscate gallons of drinks, mouthwash and shampoo and made you get into a negotiation with them over hair gel and jam. <laughs> That's true. I had a large disagreement with a guy at Luton Airport about hair gel. And along the way, they've missed things that did cause problems on planes, like the shoes Richard Reed was wearing and the drawers that the underwear bomber was wearing. By the way, Reed was flying from Miami. Reed was flying to Miami from Paris and the underwear bomber was flying to Detroit from Amsterdam. France and Holland not on the list of countries where you can't fly with a laptop. No. And this new rule doesn't apply to mobile phones. I find this quite confusing. It's strange. Yeah. It does sound very odd. The most dangerous thing that's caused trouble on planes lately is the exploding Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Well, the world is facing a crisis, Chris. You brought a us, crisis? Well, you brought us news that uh, the modern male may know how to do stuff with a laptop, might know how to do stuff with a phone, might understand what a dongle is, but cannot change a light bulb and in a time of crisis, cannot change a wheel or a fuse or do anything manly at all because of the rise of the girly man. That's right, yeah. They're, they're saying things like changing light bulbs and bleeding radiators. Bleeding radiators are dying lost. out. These are things that you need men for. And it's the women's fault. The women have been attracted to the girly man for years because he uses moisturiser. And they've been breeding with them and breeding more girly men. And eventually, ladies, you will have no men to help you out in a time of distress. There will be no more men. We'll all just become one homogenized generic sex. There'll be no difference between women and men. You need a difference. You need your man to smell of man. The smell of man. Be a man. Smell of oil. Engine oil. That's right. I know what Swarfiger is and how important it is. Absolutely. Know the difference between engine oil and gear oil. You know, these are, these are important things. Joe's on the phone. Morning, Joe. Good morning, Graham. I just wanted to let you know that the Heaney clan is doing its best to keep the testosterone male alive. Yes. My father was an Irish guard and went to war in Ireland. Yes. I was a firefighter for 14 years. Firefighter, Yes. Yes, get in there. My eldest son is a roofer. My youngest son is currently studying uh, in an apprenticeship to be a joiner and working on a building site. And all of my three boys are rugby players. Joe, 
by breeding proper men, you might just save the human race. I can only give it my best shot, Graham. I, I, I appreciate you being there, Joe. Thank you very much for checking in. Cheers, bud. Have Thank a good you. Day. Ta-da, bye. Turn your knob to Bob. <laughs>